Hey heroes, welcome to another astonishing episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to contribute and vote in monthly polls, then you can sign up for an amount of your choosing over at patreon.com slash marymarvelite. The link is in the description below, and of course you can also help support the channel simply by leaving a like on the video. In many ways, this week's tale begins with an ancient entity known as Zarathos. Where this being originally came from is unknown. While he is most often referred to as a demon, he was evidently not born in hell, and some have even speculated that he was at some point a fallen angel, although such claims are purely conjecture. Regardless of his origin, Zarathos reportedly first appeared on Earth over 21,000 years ago and sought to increase his strength by obtaining a mystical artifact called the Medallion of Power. During this time, he was opposed by a cult of immortal superhuman sorcerers known as the Blood, who thwarted his earliest schemes. Zarathos and the Blood clashed over the following centuries, during which time most of the Earth was controlled by two warring empires, Atlantis and Lemuria. Whereas Atlantis was an advanced human civilization, Lemuria was controlled by a race called the Deviants, who subjugated much of mankind. Around the year 18,000 BC, an Atlantean sorceress named Zerid Na prophesied that Atlantis would sink beneath the waves. However, this was seen as blasphemy by King Kamu and Queen Zartra, and after refusing to recant this prediction, Zerid Na was banished from her homeland. She learned many secrets about the world from the god Volka, after which Zerid Na founded a cult who recorded many of her teachings. Her prophecy was soon proven right when the space gods known as the Celestials visited the Earth to judge the progress of their creations, the Eternals, and the Deviants. Deeming the Deviants as failures, the space gods annihilated their empire, causing a global flood that sank both Atlantis and Lemuria to the bottom of the ocean. In the midst of this great cataclysm, a number of humans and animals survived aboard a wooden ark and were guided to safety by the flying eternal Icarus. However, it seems that this global flood may have been orchestrated by another entity, Yahweh, an enigmatic but powerful deity who is said to work in mysterious ways. Of course, due to the prevalent of modern monotheistic religions, many will know this being simply as God. Residing in heaven with his legions of angels, God had grown displeased with mankind's wickedness. In the wake of Lemuria's destruction, he sent down a torrential rain that washed over the earth, contributing to the Great Cataclysm. When the water subsided and the skies cleared, God placed a rainbow in the sky as a promise to never again smite the entire planet. However, humanity's capacity for evil remained unchanged, and so God decided upon a different tactic. Bonding a vestige of his own power onto human hosts, he created a number of powerful warriors called the Spirits of Vengeance. Appearing as flaming skeletons, the spirits existed only to punish the wicked and prune mankind of undesirables. God tasked the banished archangel Zadkiel with watching over the spirits and ensuring that their heavenly origins remained undetected. He was chosen because he had previously sided with Lucifer during his rebellion against heaven, but ultimately Zadkiel betrayed Lucifer. And so while Lucifer and his lieutenants were banished to hell and transformed into demons, Zadkiel was simply forbidden from serving in heaven. With Zadkiel watching over them and obscuring their true purpose, the Spirits of Vengeance joined forces with the Blood and aided them in their battle against Zarathos. During this, one faction of the Blood did defect as they came to worship the demon. Becoming known as the Fallen, they strengthened Zarathos by feeding him negative energy from mankind, and even succeeded in obtaining the ancient medallion of power that the demon sought. With little option remaining, the Spirits of Vengeance opted to stop Zarathos by any means necessary, and sacrificed their own lives to seal the demon's essence within the medallion itself, along with their own. 
While Zarathos's physical body was turned to stone, his essence within the medallion became permanently intertwined with that of the Spirits of Vengeance. While the artifact could never truly be destroyed, the remaining members of the blood shattered it into pieces. To keep them hidden, the pieces were then embedded into the very souls of two human families, and a member of the blood known as the Caretaker watched over them. Although at some point, at least 4,000 years ago, enough shards were collected from one of the bloodlines to construct a similar artifact, the Amulet of Zed. For several millennia, Zarathos remained dormant, but then, about 2,000 years ago, a Native American tribe came upon the demon's earthly remains. Against the wishes of his chieftain, a mage named Kanutu succeeded in resurrecting Zarathos, which pulled some, but not all, of the demon's essence back into its body. While not as powerful as he once was, Zarathos granted Kanutu and his followers the power to conquer first their own tribe and then their neighbors. In exchange, the demon was provided with souls to feed on, and he slowly began rebuilding his strength. He amassed a large following of worshippers who constructed the dreaded City of Ten Thousand Souls, where Zarathos continued to feed and drew further strength from their devotion. However, this time his actions caught the attention of another demonic entity, the Hell Lord Mephisto. We talked about his origins in my video about Diamond Hellstrom, but the short version is that Mephisto is essentially a devil who rules his own Hell Dimension and is one of several Hell Lords, including Lucifer, to have used the name Satan while interacting with humans. As a being who collected human souls for himself, Mephisto was enraged that those consumed by Zarathos were forever destroyed. Looking for pawns to help him stop this, he took notice of a young prince and his beloved princess. As the acolytes of Zarathos rolled across the land, they came to the couple's village and captured the princess. Desperate to save his beloved, the prince called out to the gods, hoping one would answer his prayers. When he did, Mephisto appeared before him and offered to help in exchange for his soul. The prince agreed and went to confront Zarathos before he could consume the princess's soul. When the demon attempted to take the prince's soul instead, he quickly found that he could not, as it had already been claimed. Witnessing this failure, a wave of doubt washed across Zarathos's followers, causing the demon to weaken. You see, by forming a cult of worshippers, Zarathos had become something akin to a god, and a god's strength ebbs and flows with the faith of their followers. Seizing upon this opportunity, Mephisto manifested on Earth and struck the demon down, shattering any remaining faith in him. The devil laughed, and Zarathos screamed as the city of ten thousand souls collapsed around them. With one final strike, Mephisto turned Zarathos's body back into lifeless stone and shattered it before claiming the demon's spirit for himself and bringing it back to hell. The prince and princess both survived this ordeal, but having sold his soul to the devil, the prince was no longer capable of love and departed. Without a soul, he was rendered immune to the effects of aging, and went on to become the sorcerer known as Centurius. Meanwhile, Mephisto enslaved Zarathos by wiping his memories, and over the following centuries, bound him to a number of human servants. While all that was happening, the group that opposed Zarathos in ancient times, the Blood, slowly drifted apart until only Caretaker remained. He continued watching over the bloodline who still carried the shards of the Medallion of Power in their souls, the Kale family. The earliest known member of this lineage was Ilyana Kale, whose ancestry could be traced all the way back to Zered Na's original cultists. After learning the secrets of mysticism from both an angel and a demon, it was Ilyana Kale who transcribed the cult's teachings into a single book, the Tome of Zered Na. In the 18th century, Ilyana's descendant, Noble Kale, lived in an American town called Patience. 
One stormy winter day outside of town, Noble and his father, Pastor Destin Kale, came upon a caravan from the Quentin Carnival of Magics. Trapped in the snow when one of their horses collapsed, the caravan was in dire straits. Making matters worse, the carnival's owner, Caleb Quentin, soon fell victim to the cold as well. The rest of the caravan was rescued by the Kales, and Noble was immediately smitten with a young woman named Magdalena. The two soon fell in love, but Magdalena was neither white nor Christian, and Patience was a very religious community, and so Noble kept their relationship a secret. Magdalena was allowed to stay in the town, but was treated as lesser and forced to do menial labor for the church. When Magdalena later became pregnant with Noble's child, he hoped that his father would approve of their love. Suffice it to say, Pastor Destin Kale was not accepting and savagely punished his son for his interracial relationship. He did have them marry, but would not let them actually be together, as Noble was forced to work the fields away from home. Furthermore, once their child was born, Pastor Kale tore it away from Magdalena, declaring that it would be raised in a proper Christian household. In the midst of all of this, the town of Patience continued to be prosperous with healthy crops, good weather, and next to no illness. Sometime after being separated from her husband and child, Magdalena discovered the secret truth behind this prosperity. Pastor Destin Kale, you see, was a warlock who traded souls to Mephisto in exchange for good fortune. However, before Magdalena could tell anyone about this, Pastor Kale destroyed her credibility by taking her to the center of town and accusing her of being a witch. Noble tried to save his wife, but after striking his father, he was overwhelmed by the rest of the townspeople. Taken away by his father, Noble Kale was tied up, drugged, and badly beaten. After that, the pastor prepared Magdalena's execution and told her that Noble never truly loved her. Having not seen his attempt to reach her, Magdalena was burned at the stake believing that her husband had abandoned her and, with her dying breath, cursed the entire town. As she died, this final prayer was answered not by angels or by demons, but something else entirely, the Furies. Olympian spirits who avenge the deaths of women who were wrongly killed. The three Furies, the Maiden, the Crone, and the Dark Mother, hunted and killed the denizens of Patience for seven nights, starting with Pastor Kale's youngest son, Noble's little brother, Dante. Surviving these attacks, Pastor Kale contacted Mephisto once again and offered Noble's soul in exchange for a warrior powerful enough to defeat the Furies. Sensing the shard of Zarathos's medallion embedded in Noble's soul, Mephisto agreed and had the pastor prepare a dark ritual. Activating the medallion's power, Mephisto transformed Noble Kale into a flaming skeletal warrior, much like the Spirits of Vengeance. He had become a Ghost Rider. Charging atop a demonic steed with a fiery mane, Noble savagely and tirelessly battled the Furies for three days and three nights before rending the flesh from their bones and emerging victorious. After that, Pastor Kale tried to reward the Ghost Rider by providing him with a meal, Noble's own infant son. Feeling hunger and temptation welling up within him, Noble Kale refused and attempted to end his own demonic existence to save his child. Mind you, it is not so easy for a Ghost Rider to truly die, and so Mephisto then arrived to take Noble's soul back to hell. However, before he could, he was interrupted by the angel Uriel, who declared that Noble's act of self-sacrifice proved that he was too good and pure to be taken. The two argued and for a brief moment foresaw the widespread destruction that would be unleashed if the disagreement escalated into a full-on war. The moment passed and both sides agreed that such a conflict would benefit neither heaven nor hell. 
Uriel offered his own soul in exchange for nobles, but Mephisto was uninterested in the angel's martyrdom. In the end, the two agreed that Noble would belong to neither heaven nor hell, but would serve both as a new spirit of vengeance, a force for good tempered by evil, a ghost rider that would avenge the innocent by seeking out and punishing the wicked. Furthermore, Noble's descendants would forever be blessed and protected. With that, Noble was sent to dwell in the space between realities where he would reside until vengeance was needed and would return once penance was achieved. Uriel departed, but it seems the devil had one more trick up his sleeve. Although he could not harm Noble's child directly, he placed a new curse on the Kale family. In each subsequent generation, the firstborn would inherit Noble's duty and serve as his human host, allowing him to walk the earth as a spirit of vengeance. Pastor Kale, meanwhile, was granted immortality and tasked with branding each host with the mark of vengeance, the same symbol as Zarathos's medallion of power. I will note that in the early 1870s, a school teacher named Carter Slade also used the name Ghost Rider while operating as a masked vigilante, but this is largely unrelated to Zarathos, Kale, and the Spirits of Vengeance. Mephisto's curse continued to be passed down generations of the Kale family until it reached a woman named Naomi Kale. A talented motorcyclist and recovering drug addict, Naomi launched a lucrative stunt riding career alongside her lover, Barton Blaze. The two performed at the Quentin Carnival, which was owned by the descendant of Caleb Quentin. However, when Naomi and Barton had children of their own, she sought to protect them from her family's curse. She left her oldest son, Jonathan, with Barton, and thus Johnny Blaze grew up in a world of motorcycles and cheering crowds. Unfortunately, this meant that Johnny witnessed his own father's death when a stunt went wrong and Barton Blaze met his end. Meanwhile, Naomi disappeared with her two younger children, Barbara and Daniel. Those two were adopted by a woman named Frances Ketch in Brooklyn's Cypress Hills, and grew up unaware of their heritage. Johnny, meanwhile, was taken in by another family at the carnival, Crash Simpson and his wife, Mona. Between the trauma of losing his real parents and the age he was at when it happened, Johnny repressed any memories of his missing siblings and mother. The Simpsons believed that this would be less painful for him than knowing the truth, and told him that his real mother was a woman named Clara, who died shortly after his birth. Keeping his father's last name, Johnny Blaze was raised alongside Crash and Mona's daughter, Roxanne, and the two formed a close bond. Meanwhile, Naomi Kale investigated all manner of arcane magic, sacrificing her own health to cast a protective spell over Johnny and free him from Mephisto's curse. She later returned to the Quentin Carnival four years after Barton's death, hoping to see her son before her time came as well. She ran to his rescue when he was attacked by a group of bullies, but the happy reunion she craved would not come to pass. Still furious at her for leaving, Crash pulled Naomi away and made sure that she left before talking to Johnny. After that, she swung by Cypress Hills to try and catch a glimpse of her other children. She was noticed from afar by her youngest son, Danny Ketch, and while the moment lasted only briefly, she was happy to see him. Shortly after that, Naomi Kale was confronted by a manifestation of Mephisto who demanded that she serve her purpose by transforming into the Ghost Rider. While he was forbidden from directly harming her or her children, he assured her that he was more than capable of traumatizing them by taking away their friends and loved ones if she refused to obey. Enraged, Naomi succumbed to the change as Noble's spirit of vengeance overtook her. As the Ghost Rider, she struck at Mephisto and his demonic minions, however, this transformation would prove to be her last, as the last of her failing body's life force was drained away. 
She hoped that her death would finally put an end to her family's curse, but then her ancestor, Pastor Destin Kale, arrived to claim otherwise. As he prepared to bury her in a Cypress Hills cemetery, the twisted pastor declared that just because Johnny had been freed from the family curse, it didn't mean he couldn't still become a ghost rider of a different sort. Furthermore, he revealed that Mephisto had renegotiated his contract with Uriel, and since the firstborn was not available for duty, his responsibilities would be passed on to his oldest sibling, Barbara Ketch. But rather than brand her with the mark of vengeance, he burned the symbol into Naomi's motorcycle before throwing it into the grave with her. Meanwhile, the Amulet of Zarathos, which still contained a vestige of the demon's power, had fallen into the possession of a man named Professor Henry Brandeis. When Brandeis's attempts to study the amulet resulted in his death, his brother-in-law, archaeologist Max Parrish, came to investigate. The situation quickly got more complicated when the at-the-time immobilized vampire lord Dracula sent an earth golem impersonating the immortal alchemist, the Count of St. Germain, to steal the amulet. Furthermore, the Zarathos fragment within the amulet attempted to join with Brandeis's teenage neighbor Johnny Storm. To save the boy and defeat the golem, Max Parrish used the amulet to transform himself into a ghost rider. He also forged his niece's car into a motorcycle with the amulet, having changed shape to resemble the original medallion of power affixed to the front. Zarathos wanted to use Max as a permanent host, but Johnny Storm was able to pry the medallion free, severing their tenuous link. While Max was returned to normal, the bike reverted back into a car and crashed into a pile of scrap metal along with the amulet. The debris was later taken to a scrapyard in Brooklyn that bordered the previously mentioned Cypress Hills Cemetery. It seems that Mephisto seized upon this opportunity to retrieve the fragment of Zarathos's essence from the amulet and returned it to his demonic servant. Turning our attention back to Johnny Blaze, he continued living with the Simpson family as their stunt cycle show traveled the country. He longed to ride with them and spent five long years training with Roxanne, awaiting the day that he could join the show. But then, when Johnny was 15 years old, there was an incident in which the bike he was riding suddenly caught fire. He managed to leap off without serious injury, but just as his adoptive mother rushed over to check on him, the bike exploded and Mona Simpson was caught in the blast. Fatally injured, Mona asked Johnny to promise her that he would never ride in the show. Blaming himself for her injuries, Johnny agreed, although neither Crash nor Roxanne knew about this promise. In the wake of Mona's death, Johnny found himself drawn to the occult for reasons he didn't fully understand. However, his study of demonology and satanic rituals left a bad taste in his mouth, and he abandoned the topics. Meanwhile, over the next five years, the surviving Simpsons grew increasingly frustrated with Johnny's refusal to ride, and even considered him a coward when he didn't explain his motivations. He continued practicing in secret, but one day Roxanne stumbled upon him and began watching. After several months of this, she finally confronted him, and Johnny admitted the promise that he'd made to Mona. After that, the two adoptive siblings admitted their true feelings for one another and secretly became lovers. Meanwhile, after years of struggling, the Crash Simpson Cycle Spectacular finally booked a gig at Madison Square Garden. Johnny and Roxanne were elated, but then Crash delivered the devastating news that he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Roxanne insisted that Johnny could fill in for Crash, but he still refused to break his promise to her mother. Heartbroken, Roxanne again accused Johnny of being a coward and stormed off. Desperate to save the man who raised him, Johnny Blaze turned his attention back to his discarded occult texts looking for an answer. In the end, he decided to try striking a deal with Satan himself and performed an arcane ritual to summon the Prince of Darkness. 
This, of course, was just the opportunity that Mephisto was waiting for, and he manifested in front of Johnny in the guise of a Satan. In this instance, it seems that Mephisto was working in conjunction with at least one other Hell Lord, Lucifer, as both have taken credit for this interaction. In any event, Johnny asked only that Crash Simpson be spared the effects of his illness, and the devil agreed, declaring that he would return another day to collect his payment. Three weeks passed, and Crash remained healthy, but when the day of the big show came, the old man believed that it would be his last. As such, he decided to perform an extraordinarily dangerous jump, and neither Roxanne nor Johnny could convince him not to. The crowd watched in horror and amazement as Crash Simpson jumped a line of 22 cars. He nearly made it to the other side, but landed just shy of the ramp and crashed against the final car. Paramedics rushed to his side, but Crash Simpson was already dead, likely having been killed on impact. Hurt and frustrated, Johnny leapt atop his own bike and decided to attempt the jump himself, ignoring Roxanne's pleas for him to stop. He successfully performed the dangerous stunt and made it to the other side without incident, but his recklessness disturbed and upset Roxanne, who couldn't believe that he'd even tried it. That night, while Johnny Blaze was alone, the devil returned to claim his prize. Mephisto sought to take Blaze's soul and turn him into his own personal ghost rider by fusing the spirit of Zarathos into his body. However, the process was interrupted by Roxanne, who had learned a banishing spell from one of Johnny's occult books. Brandishing a Bible and protected by her love for Johnny, Roxanne offered a prayer to the heavens to save her lover's soul. This prayer was answered not by God, but by the archangel Zadkiel, overseer of the ancient spirits of vengeance. With his intervention, Johnny Blaze was indeed transformed into a ghost rider, but not one that would be subservient to Mephisto. He was indeed fused with the essence of Zarathos, but much like his ancestor, Noble Kale, he'd become a spirit of vengeance. Initially, Johnny believed that the darker persona he adopted while transformed was an aspect of his own psyche, not realizing that he shared his soul with a demonic entity. As the Ghost Rider, he gained a number of supernatural abilities, including the power to generate and manipulate Hellfire, and even to forge it into a flaming motorcycle. The Johnny Blaze Zarathos Ghost Rider went on to punish the wicked and fight evil as a spirit of vengeance, but those adventures will have to wait for another day. As for what happened to his siblings, Barbara and Danny Ketch, well, let's just say that this story isn't finished yet. And so come back next week and we'll reveal the origin of yet another Ghost Rider. In the meantime, that is all I have for you this week, and thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and share it on your favorite social media. As always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me. Let me give a special shout out to all of my Patreon and Ko-fi supporters, Twitch subscribers, and YouTube members who help make the channel possible. By signing up for any ongoing amount on any of these platforms, you'll get your name in these special thanks here, but Patreon is the one that helps determine what topics get covered on the channel via monthly polls. And as always, if there is anything in particular that you want me to talk about, be sure to let me know in the comments. But that is indeed all I have for you this week, and so until next time, true believers, excelsior!